Right, so hello and welcome back to another episode of How to Speak Victorian. So it has been rather a while since my last episode of How to Speak Victorian. It has been several months, I think. If you have appeared on this channel since my last How to Speak Victorian video, basically what I do in this series is talk about Victorian literature and how the culture and history of the Victorian period influenced Victorian literature. I've previously done five other episodes of How to Speak Victorian and I will link a playlist down below so that you can go and have a look at them if you would all like to. So the last episode I did of How to Speak Victorian was all about the most important novelists of the Victorian period period and today I'm going to be talking about the most important poets of the Victorian period. So today I'm going to be talking about Victorian poets from A to H and in a few weeks I'll be talking about Victorian poets from the latter half of the alphabet. I thought I would split it into two so that I have time to talk about everyone. As I find it a bit harder to talk about poetry than I do to talk about prose, I thought what I would do is for each of these poets as well as telling you a little bit about their life and the success they achieved in their lifetime and how I feel about their poetry, I thought I would also read a poem or an extract of a poem from all of these poets so that you can get a sense of what they were like. So so after that very long introduction, let's talk about some Victorian poets. So to start at the beginning of the alphabet, first I'm going to talk about Matthew Arnold. Now Matthew Arnold was born in 1822 and he died in 1888 and he was quite popular during his lifetime as well as being a poet he also wrote a lot of essays and very interesting articles for numerous journals and so on. His first poetry collection was published in 1849 and his poetry was really very much enjoyed and liked during his lifetime. He was also very well received by critics and he became the chair of poetry at Oxford University from 1857 onwards. I really enjoy his poetry, I think he has a great way with words and he writes a lot of very interesting stuff. A lot of his poetry deals with similar themes to his non-fiction writing. He writes a lot about religion and especially about his kind of doubts as the Victorian period goes on and the way in which the changes in society affect how he feels about religion. So the poem I'm going to read to you of Matthew Arnold is called Dover Beach. This is one of his most famous poems and also I think one of his best. I think it's really beautiful so I will read the whole thing for you now. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the ebb meets the moon blanched sand, listen, you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves sunk back and fling at their return up the high strand, begin and cease and then begin again with tremulous cadence slow, and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles, long ago, heard it on the Aegean, and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once, too, at the full, and round earth's shores lay like the folds of a bright girdle fold. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. Our love, let us be true to one another, for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help for pain, and we are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. I really do think that Matthew Arnold is one of the greatest poets of the Victorian period. And now, let us talk about the Brontes. Obviously I already did speak about the Bronte sisters in my Victorian novelist video, but all three of them did write poetry, and their first publication was in fact not any of their novels, but it was a collection of poetry. In 1846, the three sisters published an anthology of poetry covering all three of their works under their pseudonyms Acton, Cura, and Ellis Bell. So before their novels were into the world, their first introduction to the literary scene was with poetry. So Anne Bronte was born in 1820 and died in 1849 from tuberculosis, and I'm going to read one of her poems for you here. It's not the most cheeriest of poems, If This Be All, by Anne Bronte. Oh God, if this indeed be all that life can show to me, if on my aching brow may fall no freshening dew from thee, if with no brighter light than this the lamp of hope may glow, if I may only dream of bliss and wake to weary woe, if friendship's solace must decay when other joys are gone, and love must keep so far away while I go wandering on, wandering and toiling without gain the slaves of others' will, with constant care and frequent pain despise forgotten still, grieving to look on vice and sin yet powerless to quell the silent current from within the outward torrent swell, while all the good I would impart, the feelings I would share, are driven backward to my heart and turned to wormwood there. If clouds must ever keep from sight the glories of the sun, And I must suffer winter's blight ere summer is begun, 
If life must be so full of care, then call me soon to thee, or give me strength enough to bear my load of misery. Not, not a happy poem, but there we go, they didn't lead very happy lives. Charlotte Bronte, the eldest of the Bronte sisters, was born in 1816 and died in 1855. She was 38 and outlived her sisters. In general, I do prefer the Bronte's novels to their poetry, but I think their poetry always has interesting rhythm and similar sort of natural imagery to what you get in their books. But all of their poetry does conjure up that same sort of sense of claustrophobic misery that their books sometimes have, but I think in a much more intense and heart-wrenching way, because there is often glimmers of happiness in the Bronte's books, and their poetry doesn't tend to be that happy. The poem I'm going to read to you by Charlotte Bronte is a poem that she wrote on the death of her sister, On the Death of Anne Bronte, by Charlotte Bronte. There's little joy in life for me, and little terror in the grave. I've lived the parting hour to see of one I would have died to save. Calmly to watch the failing breath, wishing each sigh might be the last, longing to see the shade of death over those beloved features cast. The cloud, the stillness that must part, the darling of my life from me, and then to thank God from all my heart, to thank him well and fervently. Although I knew what we had lost, the hope and glory of our life, and now benighted, tempest-tossed, must bear alone the weary strife. Emily Bronte was born in 1818 and died in 1848. Like her sisters, she died very young. Now, it's actually Emily Bronte who, of all of the Bronte sisters, has gone on to become the most famous for her poetry as well as her fiction. And I don't know if that's partly because she only wrote one novel, so therefore people have looked a bit more closely at her poetry, whereas her other sisters produced more fiction. And maybe it's because her poetry is a little bit richer in its visual imagery than some of her sisters' poetry. Wuthering Heights, I would say, is probably more of a poetic novel than the novels of Charlotte Bronte and Anne Bronte in terms of the language that is used and the way it uses ideas of romanticism with the capital R and the sense you get both in her poetry and in Wuthering Heights of the significance of visual landscape and of this kind of sublime power of nature. I'm going to read you quite a short poem by Emily Bronte which I quite like so anyway this is The Night is Darkening Round Me. The night is darkening round me, the wild winds coldly blow, but a tyrant spell has bound me and I cannot, cannot go. The giant trees are bending, their bare brows weighed with snow. The storm is fast descending, and yet I cannot go. Clouds beyond clouds above me, waste beyond wastes below. And nothing drear can move me. I will not, cannot. Now let's talk about Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was born in 1806 and died in 1861. She was married to Robert Browning, who is also a poet, and I will talk about him in a minute. She published her first poetry when she was Miss Barrett, when she was unmarried. And in 1844, Robert Browning, also a poet, liked her poetry so much that he decided to write to her and tell her how much he enjoyed her poetry. They met shortly after that and got married two years later when she was about 40 and him, I think, five or six years younger. And I think part of the reason why she kept her maiden name as well as her married name was in order to preserve the poetical reputation that she'd had as Elizabeth Barrett. Her first poetry collection was published in 1826 and she was publishing poetry throughout her lifetime. She was arguably the most popular female poet of the Victorian period. She is perhaps most famous for her 44 poem sonnet series which she wrote for her husband. And this one, Sonnet 43, is possibly the most famous of her works. How do I love thee? Let me count the waves. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach, when feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, my sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Not a death in Victorian poetry. And moving on to her husband, Robert Browning. Robert Browning was born in 1812, the same year as Dickens, and died in 1889. His first poetry collection was published in 1833, but it was actually in the 1840s and later on that he achieved proper success, and he was less appreciated in his lifetime than he is now. He's now often remembered as one of the most famous poets of the Victorian period, along with Alfred Tennyson, but actually he wasn't that successful until a little nearer the end of his life, and after his marriage to Elizabeth Barrett Browning, who for a while was more successful than him. Now Robert Barrett Browning is most famous for very long dramatic monologues where he takes on the voice of a particular character, sometimes from myth and legend, sometimes from his own mind, and speaks as that character would speak. His poems are very long and often narrative poems, which is something I quite enjoy. I think his poetry is very interesting in looking at how character is built in poetry. So I'm going to read you some of My Last Duchess, which is probably my favourite poem of his and one of his most famous as well. My Last Duchess by Robert Browning. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now, 
Frau Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Would it please you sit and look at her? I said Frau Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, that depth and passion in its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I, and seemed as if they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask us. Sir, it was not her husband's presence only that called that spot of joy into the Duchess's cheek. Perhaps Frau Pandloff chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce that faint half-flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say? too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked wherever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. That's the first half of the poem. It is a great poem, and I advise you to go and look it up on your own. Next, Arthur Hugh Clough. Arthur Clough was born in 1819 and died in 1861. Now, Clough was actually a very good friend of Matthew Arnold, who I spoke about at the beginning of the video, and one of Matthew Arnold's very famous elegies, Thrysis, I think that's how I say it, but it's probably not. Anyway, that elegy is written about Arthur Clough, because they were very good friends. Clough had quite an interesting life. As well as being a poet, he was very devoted to Florence Nightingale, and he worked for a long time as an unpaid secretary for her. She was the cousin of his wife and he really admired what she was doing and supported her a lot during their lives. I haven't read very much of Clough's poetry and I'm quite interested in what I have read and I'd like to read more. I know he wrote several novels in verse or collections of poetry that kind of work as a novel, including one from 1849 called Amours de Voyage, which I'm really interested to read at some point even though I haven't got to it yet. He wrote about a lot of similar themes to Arnold, often dealing with social issues and especially dealing with religion and his increasing scepticism regarding religion. He was very heavily influence with new philosophical and scientific ideas that were rising in the Victorian period and this made him quite cynical sometimes about religion. So the poem I'm going to read for you now is quite cynical about religion as you'll find. So this is the last decalogue. Thou shalt have one God only, who would be at the expense of two, though graven images may be worshipped except the currency. Swear not at all, for for thy curse thine enemy is none the worse. A church on Sunday to attend will serve to keep the world thy friend. Honour thy parents, that is, all from whom advancement may befall. Thou shalt not kill, but need not strive officiously to keep alive. Do not adultery commit, advantage rarely comes of it. Thou shalt not steal an empty feat, when tis so lucrative to cheat. Bear not false witness, let the lie have time on its own wings to fly. Thou shalt not covet, but tradition approves all forms of competition. Next on to Thomas Hardy, who is one of my favourite poets of all time, although the vast majority of his poetry was not actually written in the Victorian period. Thomas Hardy was born in 1840 and died in 1928. He's a very interesting writer to look at in terms of his novels and his poetry because he is a 19th century novelist and predominantly a 20th century poet. The vast majority of his poetry was published in the 20th century and his most famous poems and indeed my favourite are his 1912 to 1913 cycle where he is writing about the death of his wife and that cycle includes what is probably my favourite poem of all time at Castle Botterell but that is not Victorian so I'm not here to speak about that today. Thomas Hardy however did publish one collection of poetry during the Victorian period and these were his Wessex poems which were published in 1898 two years after his final novel, Jude the Obscure, had been so very much slated by all of the critics and all of the public. After the scandal that Jude the Obscure caused, Thomas Hardy decided to dedicate himself to writing poetry, and he published this collection of poetry, which included poems he'd written over the last 30 years of his life, and then he went on to dedicate much more time to poetry in the rest of his life. And another of my favourite poems, the one I'm going to read to you today, was written in 1867, although not published until 1898. Neutral Tones by Thomas Hardy. We stood by a pond that winter day, and the sun was white as though chidden of God. A few leaves lay on the starving sod, they had fallen from an ash and were grey. Your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago, and some words played between us to and fro, on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing, alive enough to have strength to die, and like a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird a wing. Since then, keen lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face, the god-cursed sun and a tree, and a pond edged with greyish leaves. I've always loved that poem. I think it is very beautiful and solemn and a really lovely evocative reflection on memory. And I love that line about a smile being so dead, but just alive enough to be able to die. It's just so sad. Oh, Hardy. Poor Hardy. Anyway, 
Next I want to quickly mention Thomas Hood. Thomas Hood was born in 1798 and died in 1845 so he didn't die very far into the Victorian period. He was not around for that much of the Victorian period but he did write quite a few significant poems in the Victorian period and even though he's not a poet we tend to remember that much today his early Victorian poems do deal with a lot of themes that went on to become very important in the rest of Victorian poetry and literature. He's most famous for his comic verse but he also has quite a lot of poetry dealing with social issues. So the poem I'm going to read you an extract of today is called The Song of the Shirt. It's quite a long poem so I'm just going to read you a couple of stanzas from the middle. Work, work, work till the brain begins to swim. Work, work, work till the eyes are heavy and dim. Seam and gusset and band, band and gusset and seam, till over the buttons I fall asleep and sew them on in a dream. O men with sisters dear, O men with mothers and wives, it is not linen you're wearing out, but human creatures' lives. Stitch, 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 in poverty, hunger and dirt, sewing at once with a double thread, a shroud as well as a shirt. But why do I talk of death, that phantom grisly bone? I hardly fear his terrible shape, it seems so like my own. It seems so like my own because of the fasts I keep. A god that bread should be so dear and flesh and blood so cheap. As you can see from the extract, Thomas Hood really is dealing with a lot of issues that are very important for a lot of the Victorian period. Ideas both of poverty and the exploitation of people, but also ideas of the exploitation of women. I would like to read some more of his poetry because I think he's quite an interesting writer. Next to talk about Gerard Manley Hopkins. Now Gerard Manley Hopkins was born in 1844 and died in 1889. And although he wrote a lot of poetry during his life, none of his poetry was actually published during his life. So he's quite interesting to look at as a Victorian poet because he lived in the Victorian period, all of his life was enclosed in the Victorian period, all of the poetry he wrote was in that sense Victorian poetry, but it wasn't published until 1918. All of his poetry that was published was published posthumously and quite a while after his death. The reason why none of his poetry was published during his lifetime is probably because he was a Jesuit priest and he felt that his poetry wasn't something that was really reconcilable with that. Some of his poetry does express some doubts about religion and God. Not so much doubts that God exists, but doubts about the benevolence of God. But his poetry was eventually published in 1918 and his poetry is absolutely fascinating. I think he's one of the most interesting poets from the Victorian period because in a way, when you read his poetry, it feels like it's from 1918, not from the Victorian period, that that was when it was written. His use of language and of rhythm is very, very innovative and very different from a lot of what you find in the rest of Victorian p poetry. He's famous for this thing called sprung rhythm which I don't quite understand but I think it's to do with having the first syllable emphasised and then several non-stressed syllables and the idea is that sprung rhythm sounds more like natural speech patterns than a lot of other poetical rhythms and I think his poetry is very interesting in that sense and the way he uses language and rhythm is really fascinating for a Victorian writer. So sprung rhythm makes his poetry absolutely fascinating but also as I've just discovered makes it incredibly hard to read however I'm going to attempt to read for you Pied Beauty. Pied Beauty by Jared Manley Hopkins. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple colour as a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls finches wings, landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow and plough, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim, all things counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. There is something about his poetry that is very hard to read but also very effective in that it feels like it's rolling. I don't know how to explain it in any other way but when you read his poetry you feel yourself getting faster because he has this very powerful rhythm. But I think his poetry is very interesting. I read quite a lot of it at university but I would certainly like to read some more. And next, the final poet in the first part of my Victorian Poets video, I want to talk about A.E. Hausman. Now A.E. Hausman is often associated with being a later poet and associated with World War One. He was born in 1859 and died in 1936 and his poetry poetry was very significant especially around the time of the First World War because a lot of it is to do with the kind of natural logging for the land and a lot of it feels quite British and is uh, connected to the British countryside which is part of the reason why it became of such social and cultural significance in World War One. However his most important, his most famous collection, A Shropshire Lab, was actually published in 1898 so just about Victorian by a few years. Part of the reason for his ongoing significance as a poet and the reason why his poetry was so much beloved and so important during the First World War was because his poems were quite short and quite musical in their rhythm which meant they were often put to music and so a lot of people knew them who couldn't read. So there are tales of men in the trenches in the First World War carrying about with them little pocket editions of A. Hausman's A Shropshire Lab. A lot of his poetry does deal with themes of war and the military and it tends to be about the Boer War or earlier wars in the Victorian period because it was published long before the First World War but he does have a kind of ongoing significance and that is perhaps why his poetry is often considered a bit later than it actually is. It's, it's not often 
whom the A husband is thought of as a Victorian poet, although actually A Shropshire Lad was published during the Victorian period. But I'm going to read to you one of the poems from Shropshire Lad. This is number 40. Into my heart an air that kills from yon far country blows. What are those blue remembered hills? What spires, what farms are those? This is the land of lost content. I see it shining plain. The happy highways where I went and cannot come again. So I think that is all for the first part of my Victorian Poets video. The next one will be up in a couple of weeks. I hope you have enjoyed this video and this little delve into some of the important poets of the Victorian period. I'm aware that this video was mostly me reading poetry at you, but I don't know how else quite to get across what the various poetical styles are like of all of these poets. So let me know if you have enjoyed this video and there will be another one in a similar style dealing with other poets of the Victorian period up in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you very soon in another video.